It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. And this is the post Oscar celebration. Hi, guys. How are you? Get the chat room open here so I can see you. Um, hope you guys all had a great weekend. I had a fairly relaxing one. It was nice. Got to spend a little family time. Um, curious, how many of you guys watched the Oscars last night? Give me some plus ones if you watched the Oscars. <laughs> Good morning, Amanda. <laughs> Hey, Mojo, how are you? Haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you back. All right, so we had some Oscar watchers. Um, gotta say, uh, if you haven't seen 12 Years a Slave, go see it. It's hard to watch, really good film. And uh, the young lady that one for Best Supporting Actress. Uh, her name is Lupita Nyong'o. I probably messed up her name. Um, an incredible performance. I mean, you totally lose sight of the fact that she is acting. And uh, just, man, amazing. Uh, everybody was great in that movie. It was really, really, really good. But Lupita, just amazing. So uh, I was really happy to see that she got the Oscar. Um, so, all right, I want to uh, thank, right off the bat here, I want to thank uh, Keith LeBrant. I never know, you know, honestly, I've known the guy for like three years now, and sometimes I pronounce his name LeBrant. Sometimes I pronounce it LeBrant. Um, anyway, Keith is a great member, a great guy, um, great contributor to the community, and uh, has become quite successful. Um, using taxi and he deserves every little bit of his success because the guy is really good and really hardworking and very very talented um, there's Keith Lynch hey Keith how are you uh, anyway um, I think it was Keith LeBron that suggested uh, the idea for today's show and so I said great idea um, I think it was him, <laughs> and I said, would you mind contributing some music that I could play that would be good examples of um, edit points and um, arrangements for, uh, for instrumental stuff for film and TV. It's a different world from songs, um, and some songwriters write in a different style, a different song form for film and TV, but today we're going to talk about... Um, instrumental stuff and um, it's surprising to me how many people still ask us about you know what a buttoned ending is or a button ending uh, um, uh, what's an edit point what's a hit point same thing so um, Keith and Paul Otten both sent me some examples of their work that are good examples for you guys to see what that stuff sounds like and how it can be useful. Um, the people who I think appreciate it most are um, music editors and video editors. You know, a lot of the reality shows that are on TV today, um, it's actually the video editors that slug the music into the shows. And while they may not be music people, they do have some sense certainly of uh, what kind of music works with a certain kind of scene underscores an emotion or makes the scene feel like it's moving forward, adds uh, excitement to it or drama to it. Um, and they like music that is easy to edit because they have to work within certain time constraints. They may have 12 seconds uh, that they've got to fill. And so they're looking for a piece of music that adds the right emotion or adds the right excitement or sense of adventure or mystery or whatever they're looking for to a scene. Uh, and typically they want an ending that buttons because they don't want to have to fade it out and then crossfade it with something else. They just want a hard ending 
where it tails off naturally and boom in comes the next piece of music or the next piece of dialogue for the edit or the next scene right after it so i'm scanning uh oh good uh Paul Cotton, <laughs> Paul Cotton, Paul Otten is here. I see Pete Cotton. Yes, Paul Otten is here. And yes, Keith LeBrant. Keith, tell me, do you pronounce your name LeBrant or LeBrant? Because I've probably mispronounced it uh, to your face at the road rally several times. And uh, I had that question last night when I was working on uh, notes for the show. So... Lou Grant. <laughs> Lou Brandt is here. Yes, but how do you pronounce your name? Lou Brandt or Lou Brandt? Is it the European pronunciation or the Midwestern? Lou Brandt as in ant. Great. Good to know. I will try and not mess that up today. Um, anyway, uh, I want to thank Paul and Keith both for contributing uh, music for today's show. Um, I think you guys are going to learn a lot. It, it's not difficult, but it, it's necessary in today's market in order to be competitive with all the other people that are submitting music. Um, you want to make it easy for the end user. And as I said before, the end user oftentimes in reality shows, on reality shows, are editors. And they want stuff that just makes their life easy because it's easy to cut up. So without any further ado... I am going to start out with um, some of the stuff. And Keith sent me some very useful notes, uh, which I'm going to read to you. Uh, my take, and these are Keith's words, my take on edit points would be easy places in your track that editors can start slash stop a cue or splice two parts of your track. It makes perfect sense. Uh, there are different ways to go about this, but the most important thing to remember is to stay in time throughout the track. Um, that would be true if you're doing a record as well, uh, maybe not as necessary, but uh, anytime you cut something, you know, it's hard to cut two things together if the tempo is different. It's just not going to work. Um, the great record producer and uh, amazing engineer Tom Dowd, may he rest in peace, taught me many years ago that, uh, and this was back in the days when we would cut two-inch tape and quarter-inch tape that uh, there's a thing called the law of reciprocity that when you make a cut that whatever is on this side has to show up on that side. For instance, um, if you had like a legato string note or a piano chord ringing out or an acoustic guitar strum or a cymbal crash that that same thing needs to be on the other side of the cut um, and hopefully at the same volume so that it doesn't uh, make the edit point appear to be obvious. Well, Keith is saying make sure the tempo is the same on both sides of the cut so it's not obvious, and right he is. So, uh, yes, tape blocks and editing tape and razors. I remember it well. I can still do it, by the way. Um, okay, if you speed the... Let's see... Uh, Picture a track and maybe halfway through it, you speed up a little. Now picture that music editor wants to take the intro of that piece and splice it into the last part of the track. If you sped the piece up, those two parts will sound a little awkward when butted up against each other. There you go. Most people compose to a click, so this would be uh, would really be a non-issue. Um, you can just throw a couple of cool parts into a cue, and it's not to say that it would not get used, but if you go go the extra mile to add a couple things that would make the music editor's job a little easier, you increase the chances of getting your tracks placed and creating a new friend, which is the music editor. So uh, I am going to play one of Keith's tracks now called Take It Now, um, and he says, get that fired up, Okay, come on. There we go. Okay, so Keith says, uh, take note that all the sections in this piece can easily be cut right on the beat. Um, the editor could come in at the 12-second mark if needed or choose to start with the full intro. By the way, while we're on the subject of intros, more often than not, uh, short is better when it comes especially to instrumental stuff. Um, also for songs that you plan on pitching for film and TV, if you've got a 45-second intro, 
and the editor's in a hurry, they're not kicking back, you know, in their easy chair with a pair of headphones on, listening to music, going, wow, this is really cool, I'm digging it, I'm digging it. They're listening to 45 seconds of intro and going, is this instrumental or is there ever going to be a vocal? And chances are, 15 seconds in, they're going to think it's an instrumental piece and wish they had something with a vocal because that's what they need and they're going to be out of there in a hurry. So I would not recommend long, drawn-out intros. Um, they don't sell records and doesn't help you in the context of film and TV. So uh, the song is, or this track, instrumental track, is called Take It Now. All sections can be cut on the beat. Um, and he says something really, you know, it's only three words. He says, riff, motif, repeat. Um, that may be one of the biggest single assets to making um, instrumental music for film and TV is stick with a central motif. If you're going to try and compose a whole score, go through all this, you know, these emotional, a range of emotions and ups and downs and peaks and valleys and all kinds of dynamic changes um, through how you write, then you're going to make it pretty unusable. However, if you stick with one central motif and you add layers as you go, add and subtract layers on top of that motif, that creates a sense of dynamics and a sense of forward movement and maybe you know, you're bringing it up to an emotional peak and then you break it back down and take it back to a more basic version of the track and then bring it back up again and then break it back down. So it's all about layers, adding and subtracting the layers, um, but sticking with that central motif. So, all right, uh, Keith points out that in this piece that we're going to hear, take it now, that you've got a solo guitar which goes for 11 seconds, and then he brings in the full band at 11 seconds till 22 seconds. Then the rhythm guitars drop from 22 seconds to 45 seconds. Then he's got the full band from a minute 43 to a minute 54, which is another 11 seconds, obviously. And then full band with a drum variation um, from a minute 55 until two minutes and five seconds. He says, um, I'll point out uh, some easy spots to make an edit, which he's actually highlighted for me here. You were very thorough in doing this, Keith, and I appreciate that. I had to do very little work for today's show, and I love you for that. Um, at 55 seconds, there's an easy spot to make an edit. At a minute 14, there's an easy spot to make an edit. Uh, at a minute 19, there's another easy spot to make an edit. And then at a minute 42, there's an easy, another easy spot to make an edit. It's got a buttoned ending. Um, and he says, I usually create a couple stingers, definitely one short ending and a longer sustained one. Um, on one of his other pieces, I think it's called Weekend Is Here, he's got two versions of that track, and he also gave me four different examples of stingers that you could use along with those. So if an editor um, had the full piece and then had four stinger options, the, they would be in love with the person that did that track and probably want to use it, assuming that it works musically with the emotion or tempo of the scene that they're trying to make it work with. So here we go. Whoops. This is Keith's track called Take It Now. <laughs> Coming up to one of the edit points he's talking about. Edit. Coming up in 10 seconds to another edit point.
obviously another edit point. Okay, notice how that, let, let me play that ending again. That is a button ending, okay? It just ends, boom, on a beat, has a little ring out, it's done. So imagine that you're at the end of the scene. You know, editors do what's called back timing with music, where um, they will look at the edit point that they've got. Let's say uh, we're working on the Kardashians and they're in the car and they're racing through rush hour traffic trying to get somewhere and this music is playing good you know fast driving music and then they pull up in front of their destination and it cuts to them inside of the restaurant where they were going for their meeting with a makeup company okay um, so they're going to hit that um, button ending and then the edit is going to take you to the interior shot of the restaurant. Well, as soon as they pull up and the car door opens, boom, probably the editor is going to make the swing of the car door. When that stops, that's going to be, eh, let's see. And restaurant shot right there. So it just naturally carries you to the next scene. So that's why buttoned endings are so good, or button endings. I always call them buttoned. Um, now imagine if you had a fade at the end of that song, you would have to do a really fast dump to get out of there, or do a cross dissolve, which I mean they call it a cross dissolve for um, picture. For, it'd be a cross fade for audio, and it, it makes it harder. You could sit there and do three, four, five passes trying to bring one fader down and bring up the next piece of music. Whereas if it just naturally rings out like that, they can back time it and they can go, okay, from the point where the edit goes to the interior shot of the restaurant, we need 17 seconds of them weaving in and out of traffic, trying to get there in a hurry. So they would go to the end, the editor would go to the end of the ring out of this piece and then back time it and go, okay, I need to start the music at this point and find a beat that they can line up on and start the music at the beginning of that shot in the traffic. And then they just know that there's gonna be this natural ending on the other end that would lead them into the next shot. So are you with me so far? Am I making sense? Paul Otten says he remembers learning what a buttoned ending was. Um, on the very first Taxi TV show. Wow, good memory. If I'm not mistaken, I think I told Keith over the weekend, I think I've been doing this show now for close to three and a half years, something like that. Um, <laughs> I think I mentioned that in the context of, I'm having a hard time coming up with ideas for new shows. You know, it's like, I know that we're always getting new people in the audience and I, I, I do want to recycle information because just because somebody watched a show about button endings three and a half years ago doesn't mean that we don't have several hundred new viewers now that need to learn the same thing. But I have to be careful how often I repeat this stuff. Okay. Um, all right. So, all right. Looks like everybody's getting with the program. All right. Great piece of music. Um, great execution, Keith. Uh, not that I would expect anything less. All right. Now we're going to move on to a song called... Um, Hip Rock Rules. All sections can be easily cut right on the beat again. Editor can use the full intro with the drum lead in or take it after the drum fill. Um, at 21 seconds, there's a good edit point that would be good to end a scene. So that's another thing you can do. If you build in these hit points where you've got to stop and then it picks back up again on the one, um, sometimes you could use just that section and, and use it just to the end of that section and boom, that's all they need. But then of course there's more song or track after it. Um, at 57 seconds in, we've got a breakdown that's easy to edit to um, between a minute seven and a minute 22. We've got a, you know what? I'm just gonna let it play because you won't remember these numbers. I won't remember these numbers. Um, let's have a listen to Hip Rock Rules.
same motif, different feel, different dynamic. Same kind of mood, but different, something else different could be going on here, emotionally. Such easy edits. button ending. Love it. A little applause for that, baby. Um, so there you go. Uh, it's easy to hear how you could edit all kinds of stuff. And, and there are different moods. I mean, you know, you could take a central melodic motif and just by breaking it down to a couple of instruments, it, it says one thing emotionally. Um, and by adding other stuff to it, it says another thing, creates a different atmosphere, a different mood, um, maybe creates more tension, it's still the same motif, or creates more of a sense of forward motion, um, all those things. So, yeah, and somebody point out, Rich M says, notice that the music's also loopable. Yeah, that happens all the time, where an editor um, needs 17 seconds and the section that he likes um, is eight seconds. So if it's easy to edit, they can just double that up and they've got 16 seconds and with the ring out on the um, end, you know, of the button, boom, there's your 17 seconds. So you back time that, lay it in there, there you go. Um, Let's see, Beverly says, button ending suck, but I get that it's not so much about the art. Well, it's a different kind of art. You know, I mean, look, we're, we all have this discussion in our heads and as a group and on the forum and at the road rally. Just because you're doing music that fills a need and creates income doesn't mean that you have to stop doing music that you do for the sake of creating art. Um, one doesn't preclude the other. So do what pays the bills. You know, somebody could be a house painter and just paint walls purple, orange, or pink by day and go home at night and create uh, museum quality masterpieces. Um, they may not sell the masterpieces during their lifetime, um, but at least they'll be able to keep food on the table um, by painting walls. Well, I'm sure that uh, Keith also, and, and go ahead and answer this, Keith, but don't you also... Um, still do music sometimes it's just something that you've got inside of you um keith had a daughter well you know he and his wife had a daughter not that long ago and um he's totally in love with his kid as he should be um and i wouldn't doubt that he's probably written some little lullabies for her or written a song about what it feels like to be a new dad um, and maybe those would work for film and TV or some commercial purpose, but maybe he just wrote it because he wanted to write it because he felt it. Am I nuts? Or did that happen? Keith has three albums of original music. Okay, there you go. Um, 
written just for himself. All right, I saw that um, Paul Otten mentioned uh, three inches ago in the chat that a library he works with asked for a hit ending to be placed a few seconds after the song ends. So that's that alternate ending, a stinger or a different kind of ending. Just put it right after where the other one finishes. Um, back in the days of quarter inch tape, we used to do that where we would have alternate endings. The song would end um, possibly with a fade and then there would be actual white leader tape. And then after the leader, you would put in the alternate ending. Um, sometimes for radio edits, we would do that as well. Um, okay, we are moving on now to a song called Retro Romp. Um, the motif repeated for verse two, element added for variation slash build. Um, so from 33 seconds to 37 seconds, that section can be used as a transition piece. From 44 to 46 session, 44 to 46 seconds, there's another break that can be used as another transition piece. Um, 55 to 58 seconds, there's a bass breakdown. Um, a minute 21 to a minute 23, there's a held chord. And then a minute 31 to a minute 36 is a stinger. Also just hit the last, also just the last hit on this could be used as a stinger as well. So let's have a listen to Retro Romp. <laughs> Same motif, but a different treatment. There's that bass breakdown. Coming up in about 18 seconds, we've got the chord that's held. Again, notice that it was a button ending and had a ring out probably about what second and a half long something like that um, maybe worth mentioning that you know uh, if you're gonna have reverb on the end um, on a button ending to not have generally speaking you don't want to have like a four second decay time um, because four seconds can feel like an eternity to an editor. A lot can happen picture-wise in four seconds. Um, and it would cause them, if they want to get out sooner than that, they could dump it, they could fade it really quick. But it's just one more move for the editor have to make, uh, you know, the editor has to make rather than just letting it happen naturally. I tend to be a fan of fairly short reverb. Of course, it, it, you know, that depends if I were doing orchestral stuff. and. You know, I might use a four second decay time on stuff. For rock stuff, I use, tend to use like half a second up to maybe two seconds. Um, but that's a matter of personal taste. And of course, it's often dictated by the tempo of the song, the type of song, um, the mix in general. There's so many variables that go into that. But, uh, and you know what? Styles change. Um, gosh, it was just, I don't know, what? three, two, maybe two years ago where a lot of stuff, a lot of singer-songwriter stuff sounded really, really dry. Um, reverb, not cool. And then um, artists like Mike Snow, um, 
started coming out with stuff where it's just drowning in reverb. There are a lot of artists now that tend to use a, a lot of pre-fader reverb, which means that uh, the signal going to the uh, whatever the reverb device is, whether it's a live chamber, a plate, electronic reverb, what have you, that the reverb is not after the fader. So you can control the amount of signal going to the reverb device and it's independent of the fader. Otherwise, in a normal mixing mode, reverb is kind of automatically after the mix fader. So the more level you have on that instrument in the mix, the more juice going to the reverb device and hence making it get more reverb. Um, so you could have something that's fairly low in the mix if you're doing a pre-fader reverb pre-fader send to the reverb, if you have uh, just a little bit of that sound or that instrument brought up in the mix, but you may want it to sound like it's just steeped in reverb, you could send quite a bit of signal to the reverb device to get that effect of it's in a really large, big reverberant space. Again, hope I'm not getting overly technical trying to, you know, speak plain English. And you know what? It's time for a sip of Rockstar. Okay, um, no, we're not talking about stems today, um, but we, I think we've done a show about stems in the past and we will do another show about stems. Um, and just for those of you who are wondering, stems are just submixes um, and submixes that editors can cut in and out of. So you could have, uh, I'll give you a quick, explanation of what stems are and then we'll move back to go back to what we're doing you could have a full mix with bass drums guitar keyboard vocal percussion background vocals full mix okay but uh, you may want to do uh, a mix without vocals because the editor may love your song but they can't use vocals all the way through because of dialogue so they would want to cut from let's say the first half of the chorus um, using the chorus lyric, but then have a version, um, the second half of the chorus, the next two lines without vocals because there's dialogue that comes in at that point. They're not gonna remix your multi-track, so they would want you to give them a mixed version that doesn't have vocals so that they can cut back and forth between the two. And the only thing, well, one of the key things to remember is don't change your levels of your instruments. Um, if your mix meters, your two mix out, your mix bus, whatever you call them, if those meters are tipping just into the red with the vocals and the full mix in there, then uh, you take the vocals out and you see a little less level. Don't bring your master fader back up to compensate for that because you won't be able to cut back and forth with reciprocity. There's that word again between the first half and the second half. There's going to be a difference in level. So even if you take stuff out to do a submix or stems, um, and stems could just be bass and guitar. Um, or bass, guitar, and drums, or just drums. Maybe they just um, want to have a section where it breaks down to just bass and drums um, because something is happening and they need it to be more open and uh, the music to be a little less complex so that the dialogue can come through. So there you go. A um, little uh, explanation of stems for you. Um, Please discuss 30 seconds commercial, really need 29 and a half. Yeah, that's true. Good point. Um, I think I've mentioned on the show a couple of times. Uh, after I quit making records, I moved to New York and started um, doing a lot of audio post mixing and worked on TV commercials and sports television um, all day, every day for years and years. And yes, when you do um, audio, uh, whether it's the full mix you know, with dialogue, uh, voiceover, music, and effects, or if you're just doing music for a TV commercial, they're almost always 30 second commercials. You wanna to be totally out of there by 29 and a half seconds because computers cut from one commercial to the next commercial to a show promo and then back to the show. So it's not like some guy sitting in a control room going, uh, yes, uh, there, it's all gone. Now I'm going to crossfade back in to the next piece of audio. 
that cut, that transition is going to happen uh, with no human interaction. So if you've got a piece that has decay that goes all the way out to 30 seconds, there's a chance you're going to get cut off. So for 30 seconds, make it 29 and a half. Um, if it's a 60 second piece, make it 59 and a half. You always want to be completely and utterly out of there a half second earlier than you need to be. Okay. Um, I'm trying to catch up on what's going on in the uh, in the chat room. See if I'm miss, miss, missing anything. Hey, by the way, had dinner with Rob Shirelli on Saturday night, and the new gauge plug-in um, is done. And Rob is going to join me on the show in a couple of weeks, and we're going to demonstrate what the plug-in does. But the bottom line is, um, from the quick X, Rob and I aren't allowed to talk a lot about this stuff when our wives are present. Um, so the short version is that the plug-in um, is almost like a mastering tool. It's a really easy kind of, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, idiot-proof plug-in that makes your stuff sound louder and better. Okay, um, we'll leave it at that. It's really inexpensive and really easy to use. I haven't heard it yet. I'm gonna hear it before Rob comes on the show and then we'll do a live demo of it on the show. Um, okay, moving on to Keith's next track, which is called Built for Happiness. Um, there are no little transition parts to this cue, but the motif keeps repeating and adding elements throughout the track. As long as you're on the beat, it'd be easy for an editor to extend scenes or choose what level of the motif they want to use. So in other words, when he says level, the motif, how much stuff has been added, how many more instruments are added into the arrangement. Um, he says at one minute, notice that it's always good to bring elements back out of the track. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, many times in scenes, they have that introspective part of the scene, and then it launches back into the full track, resolving the scene. So yeah, you could come in um, and, you know, short intro, and then the full track is developed uh, with lots of, of different instruments. And then, hmm, oh, Courtney's got to think about, gee, do I get my nails done at noon or at 4 p.m. today? And then, I know, I'll get them done at 5 o'clock. And that's when the full track comes back in. So there's a little Kardashian moment for you. Uh, so let's have a listen to Build for Happiness. This is version one. We're going to hear version two in a minute. down. Still the same motif. Hmm. Do I get my nails done at one o'clock or at four o'clock? It might take Courtney this long to decide. Revelation, 5 o'clock is the best time. Now she's in the car on her way there. Okay, now I'm going to go right into version 2 of the same thing.
All right, so two different versions of that. Um, I saw somebody ask about music business consultants, and, and uh, Don Passman would probably be out of almost anybody's price range unless your last name is Jackson. Uh, great guy, really, really smart. His book is wonderful, and uh, I know him personally, but he's going to cost you like, I don't know, 600 to 1,000 bucks an hour. Um, and you really need to know what kind of consultant that you want. You know, do you, if the question is, how do I get my music out there? That's a whole other story. But yeah, you don't want to hire Don Passman to ask that question. Um, uh, I noticed that Keith said that he uses Easy Drummer, a superior drummer. Um, and I've played around quite a bit with Easy Drummer. I've got to say, um, I forget how much it costs, but it's really inexpensive. Very, very easy to use. And uh, as I've mentioned on the show before, the drums were recorded in Avatar Studios in New York City in Studio A, which is by far, I, I think I've worked in maybe not most, but many of the great recording studios in the U.S. at one point or another in my career. And I think that Avatar Studio A is the best sounding drum room anywhere. So, man, it, um, Easy Drummer is awesome because um, the drums sound pretty darn good. I mean, the real drums, the real players. Um, and then you bring up the overhead mics and they sound amazing. And then bring up the room mics and it's stunning how much of that room and how good it sounds. So I recommend that product heavily. And I don't get anything um, for saying that. Um, yes, I've heard very good things about um, Slate stuff, too. Um, okay, so now we are moving on to a track called Weekend Is Here. And after I play you this track, um, Keith also supplied me with some alternate um, stings that go at the end of it. So I'll play those for you. So this is... Weekend is here, and let's have a listen. Okay, so obviously it had a button ending on it. And now let's listen to the stingers that go along with it.
just want to mention, um, you could use a stinger. Let's say that you used the track going into a scene and then dialogue comes up and you've got a minute and 12 seconds of dialogue and you want to put an exclamation point, um, you know, like a, a musical exclamation point on the end of the scene. So you would do something like this. And let's listen to the next stinger. Whoops. Sorry. Another musical exclamation point. Here comes yet another. So any of those could be edited onto the end of the track or they could be used as standalones following the track. You know, if you, sorry. If you've got um, the full track or some portion of the track, leading into a scene um, and then maybe it, you know maybe they don't drop out of it all the way uh, maybe they just drop it way back in the mix so you still kind of feel it viscerally going on underneath the dialogue and then boom they come in with that hard ending of the stinger and again that's going to transition um, the viewers from the end of that scene and whatever that final thought is and then the decay is going to lead to the cut, video cut of the next scene and the next idea coming in. Okay, hope that is working for you. Um, and we will come back to some of Keith's stuff in a moment. Um, Paul, do you want to, I forgot to ask you for any notes that you wanted to include. Um, Mr. Otten has sent me, um, four tracks and they are called pop tickle cute saturated smoke screen and steps in that order um paul otten would you like to talk a little bit about pop tickle um in the chat room tell folks what it is that they might look for Paul might be in the restroom. <laughs> Where'd you go, Paul? There he is. Different styles. Got a few editing points in the middle. A man of few words. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's it. All right. So let's have a listen. And this is Paul Otten's track called Poptical.
motif all stripped down. Obviously, that would be great for a commercial. Really good for like a Subaru commercial or mom with kids in the car running errands. Um, lots of great stuff that you could use that for. Uh, also, a really good example of something that sounds organic. When you see the word organic, that was organic. Um, any questions for Paul on that one? Real drums, wow, awesome. Paul said, for those of you who aren't watching the chat, uh, Paul commented that those were real drums in there. And, and you can feel it, if the track feels human. Um, and it doesn't feel like a one-man band, it feels like a bunch of guys in a room playing together. Um, okay. Paul says it takes quite a few hours. Um, I'm curious, uh, Keith, can you comment, um, how long does it take you to do, like the stuff that we've heard so far, can both you and Paul each let the rest of the viewers and the folks in the chat know, how long does it take you on average to do an instrumental track like the stuff we're hearing today? Still waiting for the answer. There's a little delay for those of you who are watching the archive. Um, Keith says he usually does a track a night in about four hours. Paul says three to four hours for him as well. So there you go. Um, and, and you know, I've, I've mentioned this on other shows. Um, definitely not an original idea on my part, but if you wanna be really productive, Okay, so let's say that you take uh, three or four hours doing an instrumental track like this. Um, and let's say you've got a day job and you're doing this, you know, you get home from work at six, you hang out with the family for an hour and a half, have a little dinner uh, and go off into your studio and you're gonna work until midnight and crank one of these babies out every night. Um, it could be a really good idea to leave the settings up. Why not use the same drum sounds, the same acoustic guitar sound, the same everything sound, um, and then do a different track with different chord changes, a different emotion, um, a different complement of instruments. You're accomplishing, uh, going for a different end result emotionally, um, feel-wise, application-wise for end users. But um, there's, there have to be other things that you want to do that could use the same drum sound and the same acoustic guitar sound and, and so on and so forth. So that you don't have to go through a bunch of programming or EQing or um, setting up different sounds, just create a whole different vibe with a different chord change, different melodies, uh, different rhythm patterns, but using many of the same settings just to make yourself a little more time cost efficient um, so that you can crank out more stuff. Become a bit of a factory without losing your um, uh, originality, okay? Um, so, uh, Keith just answered Rich M's question from conception to composition, recording, mixing, and mastering all in four hours. And Keith responded, yes. To which Rich said, dang. All right. Um, that is fast. But you know what? Uh, the reason that Keith is fast is because he does it all the time. Anything that you do repetitively, you're going to get better at and become more efficient. Um, Okay, 
Uh, okay, moving on. Let's listen to Paul's second track, which is called Saturated. And uh, anything you want to tell us to set that one up, Paul? Paul's apparently much faster at recording than he is typing. <laughs> this is a rocker with real bass. He wanted an aggressive drum track. Okay, so let's have a listen to Saturated. to think about the type of scene or a commercial you could use this for and blurt them out at the end or while it's playing. probably had at least two or three requests for music for Jaguar commercials over the years from an ad agency um, and I could see that being used for Jaguar um, a car on a beautiful windy mountain road it's classy um, am I nuts Anything, uh, Benjamin says, anything serious but uplifting. And you know what? Um, emotionally uplifting and positive are two uh, key thoughts, uh, ideas, um, emotions, feelings that anytime, almost anytime you're submitting music for TV commercials, they want that uplifting, positive vibe. Yep, Mary Band Jaguar. <laughs> Not all the Jaguar stuff is executive, though. Sometimes Jaguar um, has, you know, there's smaller cars driving on beautiful, windy roads that are probably somewhere in Ireland. Yeah, Paul says this was probably written for a taxi listing that was looking for um, something like Coldplay. And, and frankly, the Jaguar stuff, I think the listings we've run, that they were looking for Coldplay-esque stuff. So there you go. Um, all right. Moving on to the third thing from Paul. This is called Smokescreen. Paul, do you want to set up Smokescreen with any info before I roll it? Yeah, the new Jaguar convertible is actually kind of small.
<laughs> make a good track for a retail pot store in Colorado. And did you guys hear about the Girl Scout uh, setting up her Girl Scout cookie table right in front of the uh, pot shop in Colorado? That kid should get an A in marketing. Okay, so this was recorded live with Paul's bass player. Uh, came up with it on the spot. He's playing upright bass. Cool. All right, let's have a listen to Smokescreen. Two microphones, he says. Great piece. Um, again, notice the ending, come right out of that ending and boom, into another scene. The, the ending in and of itself leaves you with an emotion. Um, it's not an exclamation point, but it's definitely some sort of emotional punctuation. Uh, really, really good job. All right, and last thing we're going to listen to from Paul is a track called Steps. Do you want to give us any setup for that? <laughs> leaves you with the feeling like someone rubbed dirt on you. <laughs> um, okay, Steps is the aggressive rocker Paul was talking about before. Um, real bass, lots of dynamics. All right, let's have a listen. And this one is called Steps from Paul Utten. <laughs>
so another great example of layering you know it's the same motif start to finish has a button ending on it and um, yet there are different um, different things happening uh, you know the different emotions that this could be applied to or um, substantiate just by adding and subtracting layers um, Paul says he usually starts uh, Wow, he records his drums after the other instruments are finished, except for the bass, but he starts with a MIDI drum track, um, probably just to keep the tempo even, and then goes back and lays in the real drums to add some humanity, uh, I'm guessing. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I want to go back now to Keith's CD and play you. Oh my goodness, I've got stuff floating all over here. Um, I think this is the one. I want to This is a new track that, that Keith sent me that he said is hot off the press. And dear God, I've lost. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, this is called Shuffle Town, and this is one that Keith just did uh, like last night and then sent it to me. Um, do you want to do a little setup on this one, Keith? Jigsing is asking, what's for dinner tonight? It's not me. It's our friend Scott Hansen that owns a restaurant that's always talking about what's for dinner. I have no idea what my wife is making tonight. Um, so Keith says, this is a Black Keys vibe. Um, basic rock stuff. You know, we get a lot of listings, a lot of requests, a lot of music supervisors want stuff that sounds... Um, you got to be really careful. The Black Keys are one of the few bands that have sued people for um, closely emulating um, their sound versus ripping off uh, their actual copyright. Um, but there are a lot of bands. They don't stand alone in, you know, in the sonic space or the vibe that they occupy. There are... Um, um, Black Rebel Motorcycle Club, um, I'm trying to think of some of the others, but there are several, um, if I get that name right, I don't know. Anyway, there are several bands that are in that ballpark, and that ballpark of this kind of modern, raggedy, swaggery um, blues, and I don't mean like B.B. King or Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of blues, but blues influenced um, rock with distorted guitars, distorted bass, distorted vocals, distorted everything kills me because I used to spend so much time trying to get rid of distortion back when I was sitting behind consoles and now people actually add distortion. Funny to me. Um, yeah, <laughs> Keith says, it's ironic the blues players should sue the Black Keys. Wouldn't that be turnabout is fair play? Um, okay, anyway, here we go. This is Keith's new track called Shuffle Town.
Yeah, nice piece. I gotta say, both these guys, both, uh, both, damn, uh, both Paul and Keith uh, have become friends of mine over the last few years. Um, I admire them. They are both really, really good people. They're honorable guys. Uh, they're both incredibly hardworking guys. And I've watched both of them, you know, take a little bit of information, a little bit of guidance, and just start digging for more. They take it seriously. They work on it every day. And they are both um, becoming very successful at what they do. And I have very little doubt that their retirement funds um, will be generated by the income they're making from their music, you know. And, and that's my dream for all of you guys, if you want it. Um, I think that people should be able to make money doing what they love to do. And watching those two guys and... <laughs> Paul's turning red. No, I'm just, uh, you guys know how I feel about you. And uh, uh, I feel that way. There's a, a growing number of taxi members that, uh, you know, two, three, four, five years ago were semi clueless. And I don't mean that in, in any sort of negative way, but they just didn't have the information. And putting it all together, hanging out in the forum, meeting other members that knew a little more, going to the road rally and listening to the panelists, uh, meeting mentors at the road rally, um, watching Taxi TV, and they've put it all together. And, and, and just watching people become successful is so rewarding for me that uh, I hope it's as rewarding for the rest of you guys watching them. And I hope that you guys you know, uh, who are just starting out, learn from them because there's definitely been, um, if I have to give one person credit in the film and TV department, it, it would be Matt Hurt. He was the first, it, first visible taxi member to start really nailing it and, and turning it into um, an art factory, if you will, where he was able to take his passion and his art and his craft and put it all together. And he earns a great living. Um, Chuck Henry, Stephen Baird, there's so many of you guys out there now that it just makes me proud. So thank you guys. Thank you um, to both Keith and Paul for um, letting me pester you over the weekend and sending this stuff in, in so that uh, other folks who are just starting out or midway in their arc can learn from you. And uh, any questions before we wrap the show up? Thank you, Baldwinville. He says the real meaning of life is what Michael's doing, creating a legacy that helps others in ways that can't be measured. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you, guys. Um, you know, all I did was kind of open the door, <laughs> figuratively speaking. Um, Oh, you know what else uh, I want to mention today? Um, I, I haven't been able to do the um, private taxi member only show for the last couple of Wednesdays. Um, I've had other stuff going on where I had to be out of the office or leave early to go. I went to the Guild of Music Supervisors thing um, last Wednesday. Um, I've got to say more and more frequently now, people are walking up to me at, at events like that and going, wow, you're the taxi guy, right? Um, and it's nice. I'm sure there's that ego inside of me that enjoys the acknowledgement, but more than me enjoying the acknowledgement, it's that taxi is getting props from um, some really big people in the industry. And, uh, you know, there's still a lot of people out there scratching their heads going, is that taxi thing real? You know, all they really seem to know is that we charge a fee. They don't know that we don't take anything on the back end. If somebody makes a million bucks, we don't see a penny of that. They don't really understand the process. They don't understand the screeners. They don't understand or they don't know about the screeners. They don't know about the rally. They don't know about taxi TV 
Um, and when they learn about it, they go, wow. Um, yeah, what you guys are doing is really cool. So it was nice the other night that I had, uh, you know, like one supervisor introduce me to another and say, what they're doing over there is really cool. I, I enjoyed that moment. Um, <laughs> Keith says he re, uh, Keith Lubrant says I remember when you called me way back when um, I told you I thought taxi was a scam ha ha <laughs> um, anyway yes I, any ideas that you guys have for shows because there are weeks where I walk in here you know I'll spend the better part of a Saturday or Sunday prepping a show. There are other times I walk in on Monday morning and I really don't have a clue and I have to look through old notes. I keep a, a running list of possible show ideas. Um, and I love having people like Robin Frederick on the show and um, Susan Koch and Rob Shirelli, but I try not to repeat them too often. I don't want to wear out uh, my welcome with them. And uh, so I really, would love to hear from you guys. So if you guys have any ideas for the show, start a thread on the forum. Um, as a matter of fact, you know what, maybe we should just start a taxi TV thread, uh, a place on the forum, but I want suggestions. And, um, sometimes people send me ideas, but the stuff they send me is good for just, you know, it's just one question that would take five or 10 minutes on the show. Uh, and as much as I appreciate that, I need ideas that I can build an entire show around. So I'd really appreciate your help with that. Um, you can also email those ideas to, let's send them to producer Sarah. Um, Sarah at taxi.com, S-A-R-A-H at taxi.com and put something in the subject line like taxi TV show idea and uh, make it easy for her to know what it is because all of us here get a ton of emails. Um, I would love to hear your ideas. Um, and that's about it for this week. So once again, thank you to Keith. Thank you so, so much. Paul, thank you. Um, hope you guys have a great rest of your week and that you're not digging out from too much more snow. And we will see you next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye, you guys. <laughs>